Okay. Mr. Chair, let's face it, there isn't a lot to debate today. The fact is that the finance minister has no wiggle room. Squeezed between failing economic policy, years of corruption and mismanagement, and an out of, debt, out of control debt spiral, his predecessor had the pandemic thrown on top of him to really test his mettle. And then the July insurrection came along to really twist the proverbial knife. In an act of self-preservation, Mr. Mbuweni bowed out and handed an empty vault to Mr. Gorongwana. At least I think he did. This new minister is yet to present himself to our committee four months later. So I'm not sure if he is really at the helm or not. Imagine a whole minister not appearing before a committee to present the adjustment budget or discuss the fiscal policy framework. Unprecedented. But here we are today to discuss the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill, which is the tweaking of the allocations to provinces and to, gov and to local government. Frankly, there's not much to discuss other than lost opportunities, missing opportunities. So the missing minister, once accused of missing millions, is now missing opportunities. The biggest and most obvious point is to remark that government has backed down on the firm stance on the public wage bill that they once had. And funds now need to be given to provinces to cover the increased expenditure. It would be churlish to say, I told you so. So I'll rather say, Mr. Mania told you so. Yes. Go back to the speeches here nine months ago, and you will hear the warnings. What we are seeing in this bill is some acknowledgement of the pressure that local government is under, with a gradual move being signaled to increase the local government share of the national fiscus from the hopelessly inadequate 9% up to 9.6% in the medium term. It's a welcome sign, but it remains inadequate, noting the increasing unfunded mandates and the mandate creep in an environment where the ability of most municipalities to collect revenue is under severe pressure from the economic fallout caused by the pandemic and our government's reaction to it. Yes, the almost 50% unemployment rate that was announced last week, 46.6% on the expanded definition, has a massive impact on the ability of our residents to pay their rates and taxes, to pay for electricity, water and refuge collection. If you think local government has struggled to date, just wait. Omicron just said, here, hold my beer. The biggest alarm in local government, though, is the fact that while there is seemingly no problem in spending the money on salaries, the lack of capacity of municipalities to implement financial controls and reporting is a consistent comment from the Auditor General, from National Treasury, and from Selga itself. The fact that years after the deadline for the implementation of MSCOA, there are municipalities that just don't have the ability to implement its principles is an abhorrent abuse of ratepayers' money when there is, without fail, someone drawing the salary of the chief financial officer and the accounting officer or municipal manager. The fact that annual financial reporting is so dismal even with the exorbitant amounts that are spent on consultants, is a clear sign that local government is failing. But that's not entirely true, is it? No, everywhere that the Democratic Alliance is in local government, MSCOA is implemented. Financial reporting is done on time and accurately, and it is usually rewarded with an unqualified or a clean audit. So local government is not the problem. The ANC is the problem. Casting the eye to provincial funding, some of the signals are truly interesting. Funding moved from the failing NHI project to mental health and oncology frontlines is most welcome. The movement of funds in the provincial education budget away from the sanitation line item is of huge concern. This seems to be an area that this government cannot get right. How much longer will our children be forced to use unsanitary and unsafe pit latrines, long drops, and bucket toilets? Come on, is this how we expect our people to live? 
A further concerning signal affecting both the provincial and local government spheres is a trend affecting grant funding. It seems that national government departments are seeking to entrench their hold on the public purse strings by shifting direct grants to indirect grants, ensuring that they retain control of the funds and thereby reducing the effective local government share of the fiscus below the 9% that is published. The trend has begun to be more prevalent in the water and sanitation and health departments and has now reared its ugly head in the neighborhood development grant under the control of Treasury and the Presidency. Asked for comment, Treasury reluctantly admitted that the trend is not encouraged by them as it undermines the spirit of the spheres of government and it centralizes control. Perhaps it's time for Treasury to raise their own voices. But Mr. Chair, my biggest gripe with the Dora Bill is the process that has been followed this year to bring us to this point. Many provinces voice their disappointment at the rush job done to push the legislation through, giving scarcely any time for public participation. Once again, in spite of the legislation, one province, Limpopo, didn't bother to submit a final mandate for the committee for consideration. They sent a letter saying that they were too busy with other things. The Northwest province ran a highly flawed process with a reluctance to hold a briefing, followed by a legislature sitting that broke more rules than it actually adhered to. So where are the missed opportunities that I spoke about? Well, the half-hearted increased allocation to local government is the first. The absolute absence of any funding for the much vaunted infrastructure-led economic recovery is the next. The failed reduction in the public wage bill is probably a third. The absence of a sound plan for economic development or recovery at provincial and local level, level can be number four. Perhaps number five should be a solution on e-tolls. Instead of the loose cannon, Mr. Fakili Mbalula, who has chosen to make an early pronouncement of what will be in the February budget speech, dumping the financial solution on the finance minister by admitting that Treasury is yet to find an alternative funding model. Yes, Again, conclude, unprecedented. Honorable Red, as you conclude, Thank you, Chair. time is almost up. And yes, Minister, the mischance to show that we finally have a minister with a plan that carries the support of the President and the Cabinet. For we have had promises in the State of the Nation Address that do not find their way into the budget or into the division of revenue. We've had budget speeches yes. that are still born. Your time is up. I've got 20 seconds on my clock, Chair. Please conclude. Thank you. We have had budget speeches that are still born as Cabinet enforces the will of the African National Congress. We have yet to see one cohesive, universally accepted implementation plan that will give us hope that our country is on track to recover from the wounds inflicted by your divided party. In response to the Honorable Matlangu's uh, quote from Shakespeare, I'll quote my father's favorite line from the Merchant of Venice. All that glisters your, is not gold. Your, Thank you, Chair. Time is up. Thank you very much.